In this tutorial, we'll focus on the uh, difference between, a, in mathematics, a demonstration and a proof. And we're going to first of all take a look at uh, a demonstration. And this is about what the sum of the angles in a plane triangle would be. Now, a plane triangle just means a triangle drawn on a flat surface as opposed to drawn on a sphere, for example, or a, a ball like the Earth. And so here's an example of a random triangle. And let's say that we were to cut or tear off all the angles. So let's say we ripped them here, ripped them here, ripped all that off. And then you can take the angles and arrange them so they form a straight line or a straight angle. And a straight angle is 180 degrees. So this is an example or a demonstration that the three angles in this particular triangle add up to 180 degrees. Now we could draw many triangles and tear the corners off uh, every single time and in each of those we'd find that the three angles always add to 180 degrees. But this is only a demonstration uh, for each specific triangle. It's not a proof. Proof means it's true for every single case. And while we could do that for many, many triangles, in order to prove this this way, we'd have to uh, draw every possible triangle and rip the corners off every single time, which is impossible because there's an infinite number of triangles to draw. Now, but this demonstration does lead us to conjecture or hypothesize that the sum of the angles of a plane triangle is 180 degrees. And we're actually going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a proof of this, a geometric proof, uh, in a few pages. Now, we would arrive at this conjecture by using what's called inductive reasoning. And that's the process of arriving at a deduction by looking at a number of specific examples. Here's another example of inductive reasoning. What's the relationship between the number of regions a circle is divided into by joining points drawn on the uh, edge of the circle? And so here's an example. Uh, here's the, the first circle. If we draw one point, well, there's no other point to connect it to. So there's only one region, just the inside of the circle. If we draw two points in the circle and join them together, then there's two regions. There's one and there's the second. If we draw three points in a circle and, and, and join them all together with uh, line segments, they would be called chords, it actually divides the circle into there's the middle one here, and then there's on the outside of each of the chord, between the chord and the circle. So there's four regions. Uh, four points, we actually end up getting eight regions all together. And it starts to get a little bit messier looking because there's a lot of regions. If we draw a circle and plot five points, and actually you can count them all up. This is the last one when I uh, labeled them. There actually are 16 regions. And we're going to organize that in the table on this page. From the previous page, two points, there were two regions. Three points, there were four. Four points, there were eight. And five, there were 16. And so the question is, <laughs> what would the next number be if we uh, drew a circle and joined six points together? How many regions would there be? Well, if you take a look at each of these numbers, the number of regions, they're actually powers of 2. 1 is actually 2 to the power of 0. 2 is 2 to the power of 1. 4 is 2 squared. 8 is 2 cubed. And 16 is 2 to the fourth. So they're all these successive powers of 2. Notice that the number of points, there's a relationship between the number of points and that exponent. The number of points is always one bigger than the exponent. So there's three points, it was 2 to the power of 2. There were <coughs> four points, it was 2 to the power of 3. So this exponent in each case is one less, one less than the number of points it's drawn. So we might hypothesize the next one is 32 because that's 2 to the fifth, 5 being 1 less than 6. So it looks like the number of regions of a circle divided into by n points seems to be 2 to the power of the number of points minus 1. So all these uh, powers, and of course 32 would be 2 to the fifth. You see the number of regions is 6, so the 5 actually comes from 6 minus 1. That's where the exponent 5 seems to come from. So we're actually going to do it in this page. So here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we're going to count them. So, And I'll just go in order. I'm not going to... In fact, you can do this yourself. There's no magic here or trick. I'm not trying to trick anybody. But there are, if you count them, 
not 32 regions. There's actually 31, very close. Okay, so there actually are 31 regions. So the inductive reasoning has led us to a false conclusion um, that multiplying by 2 and doubling was true the first several times, but it's not true for this case here. It has been shown that the following formula generates the correct number of regions, and uh, uh, this is a much more complicated formula than 2 to the power of n minus 1. It's a polynomial formula. And if you substitute the numbers 1 through 7 in, we get 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16, which is what we shown, we sho uh, I showed on the previous second page. And then the 31 from here. The next one actually is 57 if we uh, put uh, 2, 4, 6, 7, 7 in place of n. So uh, inductive reasoning is great. And actually, that's the scientific method. That's how scientists discover things, by looking at examples and uh, doing experiments. But it's not a proof. And um, so sometimes inductive reasoning, even though it seems to indicate something is true, it, it doesn't always have to be. Now here's some, here's some examples starting on this page of actual proofs. A proof means you've shown it for all possible cases. So consider this triangle ABC. We want to show that the three angles inside add up to 180 degrees for this plane triangle. And I'm going to start with drawing a uh, uh, a, uh, do a construction here. I'm going to draw a line through A which is parallel to the BC side. So, it, and it, there's no particular reason I drew it through A parallel to this side. I could have drawn it through B parallel to the AC side or through C parallel to the AB side. The, the proof would be the same. And so notice in this, and I'm going to label uh, these D and E here so I can refer to angles with three letters. In this uh, diagram, because uh, I've drawn DE parallel to BC, these two angles would be equal. They're called alternate angles. Uh, some people refer to this as the transversal parallel lines theorem. Uh, DE is parallel to BC, and this AC cuts through. Uh, it's called a transversal. And so these angles between the parallel lines on the opposite side of that uh, transversal, they would be equal. So that's called the, uh, and some people refer to this as a Z pattern. Okay, it kind of forms a Z. So angle EAC, which would be this one, would equal angle ACB, this one here in the triangle. Similarly, these two angles be, would be equal, and that's DAB outside of the triangle and ABC inside the triangle. Now, these three angles right here, this one, this one, and this one, have to add up to 180 degrees because they make a straight line. DE is supposed to be a straight line. So that would be all together there, 180 degrees. Now, this angle out here is the DAB angle. So I'm going to put DAB in place of that. The one marked with an X is the BAC angle inside the triangle. And this one here is the EAC angle right here. So those three angles add up to 180. Now, the DAB is equal to the ABC angle. So since ABC is equal to DAB, I can substitute in place of the a DAB the ABC angle. And similarly, the EAC angle is equal to the ACB angle. So in place of EAC, I can put the ACB because those are equal angles. And notice after I make that substitution what we have. ABC, which is this angle here, plus the BAC angle, which is this angle, plus the ACB angle, those are three angles inside the triangle and they add up to 180 degrees. So that's a proof that the three angles, the three interior angles in any plane triangle will always add up to 180 degrees. And the reason I can say that conclusively is because it doesn't matter how I draw the uh, triangle. Drawing this parallel, um, this line parallel to uh, a side through the opposite vertice, these are always equal, these are always equal, so we'll always end up with these three angles being uh, adding up to 180 degrees. So that's why that's a proof for every possibility, not just examples like in the, at the beginning of the tutorial. Now, um, proofs don't have to just be in geometry. They can be in number sense as well, or number theory as well. Uh, in this example, notice that the product of an even and an odd integer is even. So here we'll start with some inductive reasoning. Uh, this is the product of an even and an odd in integer, and it's even. Uh, two, in, 2 is even, 3 is odd, but the product is even. That's a 6. Uh, here's a product of an even and an odd, and it's even. Here's another example. An even and an odd multiply to an even number. Uh, an odd and an even multiply to an even. So there's four examples, a little bit of inductive reasoning, that is always seems to be true. The product of an even and an odd always seems to be even. Now we're going to take a look at a proof 
that covers all cases because we can't possibly multiply every single pair of odd and even numbers. There's an infinite number of them. Now I'm going to represent an even number with the expression 2n because what even means is it's divisible by 2. So if I write an, an expression as 2 times a number where n is an integer itself, then that would always have to be even. See, 8, for example, is even because we can write it as 2 times 4. Um, the number 6 is even because it's 2 times 3. It has a factor of 2, so it's even. Now, 2n, sorry, 2p plus 1 will represent an odd number. I, I don't want to use 2n plus 1 because I've used n here. That would always say that the numbers would have to be consecutive. That's why I would use a different variable here. See, uh, 2n and 2n plus 1 would be consecutive numbers like uh, uh, like 8 and 9 or uh, uh, 10 and 11 multiplying, but they don't always have to be. So 2p plus 1, 2p would be an even number. When you add 1, you get the next odd number after it. So that's always going to be odd. This is always going to be even, no matter what integers n and p would be. So we're talking about the product of an even and an odd. And if we multiply these together, the 2n distributes in here. 2n times 2p would be 4np. And then 2n times 1 is the 2n. Now notice there's a common factor of 2 here. I actually could factor a 2n out, but I don't need to factor the n out for what I'm trying to show here. If I factor a 2 out, then this would factor into 2np uh, plus n in the end. Now, since n and p are integers, this would have to be an integer, so it's 2 times an integer, and because I'm writing as 2 times an integer, that's why this would have to be even. So I've multiplied an even and an odd, and I get an expression that always has to be even. So that's always even for all integral values, integer values of n and p. So that proves that no matter what n and p are, multiplying an even by an odd is always going to be even. Now sometimes we're asked to prove something true that simply isn't true. And to disprove something, we can use what's called a counterexample. It doesn't mean we have to prove uh, it show every single case that's not true. Uh, but a counterexample just gives you an example that something isn't true, so then, well, you can't say it's true anymore. And this example says, find a counterexample to disprove, to prove it's not true, that the statement that all composite numbers are even. Now, composite number, um, their numbers are either prime or composite. Prime numbers only have factors of themselves in one, like, for example, the number three. The only factors of three are three and one. Uh, 11 is another example of a prime number. The only factors of 11 are 11 and 1. But composite numbers have factors besides 1 and themselves. For example, 10 is a composite number because 10 has factors of besides 1 and 10. 2 and 5 also divide evenly into 10. Okay, so that's an example of a composite number. So um, now this statement uh, uh, asserts that all composite numbers are even. So to disprove that, we would have to find a composite number that isn't even. So for example, 21. 21 is not even. And it is composite because along with 1 and 21 as factors, it also has factors of 3 and 7. So 21 would be a counterexample to disprove this. It's an example of a composite number that is not even. So that would be a counterexample. And so, of course, 21 is an odd number. So that's an example of a counterexample. And that's the end of the tutorial.